Um, for Mr. Baniello, um, have you had a spill of refrigerant? And if you do have a spill, do you have to excavate and get rid of the soil, or is it benign enough to just leave in place? Yeah, so we've actually been using these for 10 years in custom houses and the condos, and we've had loops break in the past before, and there's absolutely no need to excavate. All you have to do is pull out the copper and replace that copper pipe. So there's nothing to worry about in regards to environmental contamination. First, thank you everybody for participating, and we really appreciate it. So many questions, so little time. But so I'll, I'll limit my question to a community, pretty much community solar in Westchester, our electric rates are so heavily transmission distribution oriented that if I save 30% of my commodity, I'm saving less than 10% of my bill. Um, the Westchester rates, the rates set by Con Ed are across the, their entire service set territory and don't reflect Con Ed, what we're, we're dealing with in Con Ed territory. So they're way more pricey than they should be. Is there a way, so it's a two part question. How do we get the community solar to be more cost effective on, because of the distribution rates? And here's a harder question. Um, how would we get Con Ed rates to reflect what actually is happening in Westchester? So I'm, I'm happy to tell you that community solar um, credits can be applied against your entire Con Ed electricity bill supply, delivery, basic service charge, taxes, et cetera. So you can save up to 10% on your entire electric bill. <laughs> that, that would have been potentially the Westchester Power Program, which is the electricity, the renewable electricity supply program. And in that instance, you're correct. That program is focused exclusively on electricity supply but you can combine those two programs. So you can source 100% renewable energy through the Westchester Power Program or any other program that offers it, but of course we recommend Westchester Power where it's available. And then on top of that, you can add a community solar subscription and um, support renewable energy twice and benefit from guaranteed savings from community solar. Right. Does anyone else want to add to that? All right. Um, sir. Yeah, um, I'm curious. As I understand it, in a multifamily building, typically anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of the thermal energy in the building is, is essentially flushed down the, the sewer. Um, and I'm wondering, in Westchester, uh, do we have anybody who's doing wastewater heat recovery to, to try to, 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 so that we can recycle that, that waste that's getting dumped down in the sewers? Uh, I know that's being done in Europe and Canada and other places, but is anybody here in Westchester uh, recycling that, uh, the heat from the sewage? I see. I, I can't answer that question directly, but I can say that uh, the stretch code does address that and has a domestic hot water heat recovery um, requirement in the residential uh, stretch code. Res residential and I, I see Peter McCard of Westchester County uh, shaking said no. Do, do, does he have till midnight tonight? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Sir. My understanding is that uh, the, uh, I, I think everything is, my okay. understanding is that uh, the uh, electric rates are supposed to have a change that I think is postponed uh, until April uh, this year, um, switching what I believe the time of use uh, that would affect solar, uh, which uh, will no longer be able to just have a regular rate. It, that obviously is, is very important. It doesn't relate to, the, to community solar per se, which is valued in a different way. Um, but of course, it's relevant for in other contexts. I can speak to it. And then Great. Michelle will add to it. So the advantage that we have is, yes, time of use plays into, yeah, might come into play. But uh, 
when how the solar program is credited is it's not just one component. There are multiple, they call them the value stack. Um, Nina, you showed a slide um, that showed a, a building with rooftop solar. Right next to that was a huge parking lot. And I note that all over our, all of our communities, we have huge parking lots. I'd love to see, and maybe Vanella can address this too, a, a, a turnkey solution for canopies over parking lots that could be uh, that would be climate friendly, snow removal friendly, et cetera, et cetera. That community that municipalities could uh, could tie into for community solar projects over parking lots. Absolutely, that's a wonderful question. Basically, if you see a piece of land, I do not differentiate between rooftops or ground mount or parking lots although I might have some favorites depending on which way they're aligned, if it's a south-facing facility, it will be beneficial. So, for example, the, the community solar projects that the city of White Plains is doing are all on their parking garages. So it doesn't even necessarily need to be a parking lot, ground-mounted system where you could build a, a more like a canopy structure, but it could be on top of a parking garage, which is more like a rooftop carport solar. So uh, some of the sites that we will be looking at will include whether it's a piece of land or a rooftop or a parking lot that any of our municipalities or the school districts are interested in, send us those along our way and we will be able to evaluate and look at which ones are the most viable ones. And that goes here, I have a little, I know you're not able to see this, but I do have this little flyer that kind of tells you which ones are ideal features for any of these different kinds and we do have parking lots. A second one right here. And let me mention that in the new Clean Energy Communities Leadership Round, there is a project opportunity for you to use your grant funds for a carport type system, and it's almost a automatic, you can use it if you want to use it for that purpose, as well as use it for the purpose of buying down the cost of a NIPA project. So there's a lot of exciting ways that you can use your grant funds in the new program. I guess just added to this, uh, there's a lot of uh, private-owned uh, parking lot. Uh, there's a tough uh, nut to crack when it comes to uh, tenants, landlords, and uh, all these uh, complex uh, entities that own these space. I, I kind of think of a solar access right here, uh, eminent domain or something like that, but we need to be able to crack the commercial as well. Uh, because we talk about municipalities on the properties, but there's a big uh, potential on private owned land here. Uh, Mr. Boniello, you gave us uh, some comparison numbers between geothermal and uh, propane. Do you by any chance have any comparisons with uh, gas? Um, are you referring to natural gas? Um, us specifically, for the fact that we operate in northern Westchester, we don't have any natural gas up there, so I wouldn't be able to attest to that, but I would be able to tell you that the boiler system would be about, I know that they're actually the same boilers that you use in a propane system as an LP or a, or a liquid, you know, or a natural gas system. The only difference would be the actual, with propane, you have to pay for the burial of your propane tank, where with a, um, with a natural gas, you'd actually get piped in. So I imagine natural gas might be a hair cheaper because you don't have to pay for that. Everything else would be identical. So probably a little cheaper. Okay. M moderator's prerogative. Um, Ryan, are you selling your homes at a higher price? Are you moving your inventory faster as a result of this? Yeah, so we're actually really, really proud to say that within the first year, we've already sold 28 out of the first 33 units. Um, and we've actually been able to get a pretty substantial premium. Um, we, we've been able to raise our prices um, because people will come in and they'll say, first of all, no one else is building you know, anything like to this kind of spec. So, but it also makes them feel good about themselves. It's, it's the best sales tool that we've ever had. People get to come in, be like, I'm doing something good for the environment, I'll pay a premium. It's like someone buying an electric car. You know, you feel good about the purchase, you'll pay a little bit more for it, but that seems to be the trend now. So, really, really good with sales. And I trust resale values increases too. Uh, Anila Cherian with the Dobbs Sorry Sustainability Task Force. Thank you for hosting this um, panel and event. Quick question. Um, can you give us any examples as municipalities move towards climate resiliency, especially in small towns, 
like ours. Um, can you give us examples of a CHP system that might be a standalone, isolated, either natural gas or solar um, system as our towns are looking for, you know, emergency centers? Yeah, I, I'm going to need, unfortunately, to direct you to Tom because he has been running the program for 16 years and he will know where all of these systems are that the program has worked on over the years. Um, but again, you know, if you're thinking about a building at around 100 units, let's say I'm giving you a residential example because it's easily imagined, um, definitely a candidate for the TAP, but these systems can be downscaled all the way. You know, I mean, you're not going to have as, as efficient, but you can downscale them and still have gains. So be in touch with us. I'll come to you after. I'll give you my card and we'll get you in touch with Tom. Um, we have had a gentleman waiting and then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, always two parts. Uh, an easy one, shouldn't we be conducting conservation and, and, and efficiency work which the previous panel worked on and incentivizing more than just electricity uh, incentives? Uh, the other one is, how do we advise building owners when their current boilers come to end of life, do you want them to put in a new $40,000 boiler, or should they incorporate with their engineers and contractors for the conversion which will be necessary in 10 to 20 years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so we've... Yeah, okay. Yeah, as well, which was the first part of your question. Um, but we are doing significant outreach in forward looking to incorporate efficient electric heating options for existing buildings. Again, if you have a traditional boiler system for your primary heating, that's not, um, you know, that's a central heating system usually. You want to look towards VRF systems, um, which are, you know, you don't need to drill, so you don't have to change your footprint of your building. Uh, you don't need a lot of land outside of your building to, to drill geothermal. So you could do a VRF system uh, in that solution, or depending on the, the height and scale of the building, you could do a ductless mini-split solution, um, which has many other opportunities uh, for tenant comfort and control. You, you abandon the one pipe. You, yeah. It, can, can I add something to that, actually? Please do. Right. Yeah, so we've actually... We re we've had a lot of people come to us saying, you know, wondering if they wanted to switch to geothermal, you know, after they've already built their home. And we've found the break-even period seems to really make more sense. Like, uh, like my colleague was saying, um, he was, uh, it only makes sense on really new construction. It makes way more sense. I think best bang for the buck for existing buildings would definitely be insulation and windows first to drastically reduce, to, to completely throw away your existing system, it's, it's really hard to justify financially. It would be such a long break-even period, especially those with big radiators. Um, from what we've seen, we can't really use geothermal for that. I'll just add, um, we're, we are at a transition phase with the new rules or, and the, the target set at the state and in New York City. So it's difficult to know what investments to make, but the center, Pace Center, we're working on recommendations for actually moving past gas into new technologies. And I think to the extent that if you're, you've got the capacity to be a first mover, then you're gonna help us drive down the, the learning curve and the cost curve. Uh, and if, if I could just add, um, <laughs> Sustainable Westchester is running heat smart campaigns um, to bring information about the benefits of heat pumps out to selected communities across Westchester County. In the event that you have, as um, the Somers development, large areas that are using uh, heat pumps and wells, is there an uh, a diminution of the effect because so much either heat or cold air is coming into the area at the same time that you don't get the same good effect that you get when one. You want to feel this, Brad? Um, could you, could you, sorry, could you clarify your question a little bit? Are you saying penetration into the building itself through airflow? No, no. If there's one well 
and it gets a great um, heat exchange, as you described. It works very well. If there are many, if there's a whole development in the whole area, all have heat pumps, as they did at once on Long Island a long time ago. The effect was much less, and the efficiency was much less. Uh, yeah, that's actually, that's actually a really good point. Um, there is so much cold and so much heat on the other season going down into the ground that you can't have too tight of a concentration of these wells. Um, so there will be a little bit less efficiency, but for our particular situation in Somers Crossing where we have three and four unit adjoined projects, which each have four or five wells each, going out in that kind of pyramid shape from the top, um, that's totally fine. I'm imagining if you go into like New York City, for instance, you would definitely, definitely run into that situation. But I think Westchester on the whole is well within the, uh, the bounds for still maintaining good efficiencies. Thank you. Um, just going back to the conversation about solar carports at parking lots, this is a plea for those of you with NIPA or NYSERDA um, to try and perhaps think of starting a dialogue with the MTA um, who would not start a dialogue with individual people. It's the largest concentration of parking lots in Westchester County. Uh, if pressure or dialogue was put on the MTA to actively put in solar carports, the energy from those carports could offset the energy that the MTA uses to power the trains. But this will never come from individual people, consumers. It will have to come from large organizations such as yourself, Albany, whatever. But the MTA should really start putting up solar carports in the parking lots. So a uh, very good question. Uh, MTA actually is also NIPA's customer, just like Westchester County or City of White Plains or several others among yourselves here today. And uh, uh, MTA has been working. They had issued a community solar RFP, although it was mostly focusing on the five boroughs within Man uh, New York City. But they do have plans on expanding that to everywhere else they have facilities. So we are working very closely with them on, uh, on that aspect as well, being their energy advisors. And just really quick, when people go to park and they have electric vehicles and they have storage and there's in the future vehicle to grid technology. I mean, these parking lots are really uh, amazing opportunities, it would seem, to address some of these challenges. Mr. Bruniello, uh, from an old guy who's been in the building energy efficiency business for almost 40 years, thank you so much for being a market leader in the building construction area. I do want to ask you, though, two quick things. What do you do to increase the performance of your buildings before you think geothermal, number one? Number two, have you ever had a, a field saturation issue? Seems like you've been in it for a while. Have you ever run into that? So um, first thing is how do we, what do we do to first reduce our energy demand? So um, I'm a really, really strong believer in reducing the amount of electricity you need first before resorting, resorting to, I mean, solar is amazing, but it should only make up for the last little bits of inefficiencies in your building. So what we do is we do spray foam insulation, which has pretty much come down to be a wash with fiberglass insulation. So why would you not do that at this point? Um, so we do um, spray foam insulation in the attic and the box beams. Then on top of that, we do Anderson 400 series windows. You know, we're not gonna be putting in builder's grades windows. I think that's a really easily addressable issue for new construction and even retrofittable. Um, and then the last thing which we've seen a huge improvement as a result of is we do a foam house wrap where we seal all the edges to stop airflow from coming into the house. So as a result, we're starting off with actually really efficient houses to begin with. So our electricity demand or our heating load has already been way lowered by that. And if you can supplement that with even passive solar design, you'd be even better. But then we use our geothermal systems, which now get to be a really low tonnage. Um, so as a result, the cost of our, he our geother geothermal systems have gotten way lower, where our total electricity bills are 80 bucks, which now supplementing with solar, you can vastly reduce the size solar system that you would need to then be completely off-grid. Okay, we've got time, I think, for two more quick. 
Okay, this is more common, but um, regarding the carports and regarding the schools. So I used to be on the school board in my district, and I know it is very difficult to, to do anything because the schools are so heavily you know, regulated. But carports in school parking lots seems like a win, win, win situation. I would really focus on that if you haven't already. Absolutely, completely agree. We are actually working with, I should have my colleague here, Christina Ivanu, somewhere hiding in the back, uh, but Christina leads most of the, she used to lead the K through 12 school program, solar program we had in the past through NIPA, and she's also working with several other school districts right now as we speak, and that is one of the advantages we want to bring through this program as well, because we do have a tremendous partnership with, the, with SED that uh, we can have direct conversations that makes it easy for everybody. That's the idea. And just want to mention that, you know, for those municipalities, those that are interested in a lot of these uh, topics that we've talked about today, uh, Westchester, Sustainable Westchester, Con Edison, and Nyserta are continuing these discussions uh, in May. Um, so for municipalities, that's May 14th at 9 a.m. Uh, and then also for trade and professional associations, chambers of commerce, the different uh, groups that are, that are interested in, in actually moving the market. Uh, we'll be doing seminars for them on the day before, May 13th. So uh, the conversation doesn't end here. The work doesn't end here. Uh, we're continuing this uh, really focused here in Westchester with these solutions, uh, a partnerships of all these groups necessary to make these things come together. Uh, again, that's May 13th and May 14th. Uh, please see me and my colleagues at Sustainable Westchester, uh, friends here, uh, for more information about how to register for those events. Thank you. Sir. What do you think this conversation will sound like in 10 to 15 years? That's a, almost a, a philosophical question. Well, it is, but uh, let me just tell you, 10 years ago, a lot of the ideas that are central to our climate action planning didn't even exist. You know, so nobody had done LED streetlights, nobody was doing community choice aggregation. There's a, a lot of new opportunities that are gonna emerge. That's why we have to be vigilant and listening and have forums like this so that when people do bring up good ideas, you know, that we can kind of take them and run with them. You know, the, 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 the best thing to do to kind of shape a future in 10 or 20 years is uh, for creating opportunities for you to learn from me and for me to learn from you and for us to do that a million times, you know, so thanks. All right. I just want to add, in 10 years uh, is uh, 2030, we'll have achieved 70%. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I love to see, I remember a couple of months ago, I was in the conference like this, and we showed a, a slide where at that time it was still 50%. And we were looking at how much we had to do to get there. And what we asked him, you know, recently we signed that CLCPA and it just drew a line. Well, that's what we have to do. It's a moonshot. And we... Uh, it is. It is. It is going to require a lot of, you know, a lot of actions. And leave it to the geeks. Uh, I, I mean, Thank you for the ideologues. Thank you for the legislation. Leave it to the technical now, because we have to, to go there in 10 years. And just, may I just have one yep, other thing? Uh, so other things that are happening at NYSERDA, I mean, not to, because of the legislation, I know, but to try and develop a carbon neutral roadmap uh, for how we can achieve this carbon neutrality going forward with both technologies and strategies and legislation. Uh, part of that is to have a mandated state energy code that is net zero. So, you know, that's, thank you, that's all part of the planning and all part of the work that we're working on. This stretch code is a baby step and it's acknowledged as a baby step because we've been dealing with federal preemptions that prevent us from putting in more of it. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, that prevent us from putting in more efficient equipment that, you know, that the feds already have uh, standards for. So we are working really hard to make this next code even better than the stretch code that we just did. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I want to close it with one small thing. As a millennial and probably trying to be the most optimistic one here, uh, maybe in 10, 15 years, we will not need a Westchester Clean Energy Summit, but we'll have a Westchester Clean Energy Celebration. Right, Peter? Yeah. <laughs> I, I am going to 
we're, we're a little over, and I'm, I don't need as a full 10 minutes, but uh, I think we should probably close Q&A at this point. I'm, I know there are a few more hands out there, um, but there is going to be some time afterwards to talk with people individually up at the front. And, um, and, and also, I mean, all of you are uh, tremendous experts, and you're involved in the community, and this has been a really good, robust discussion. So we should do this more often. We should get together in the future. This is actually quite useful, I think, for everybody who's participating to hear each other. Um, I want to thank both panels uh, for participating. And I also want to thank our partners. Thank you. The New York League, Conservation Voters, and Sustainable Westchester. I also want to thank members of the PACE community that supported the event, Radina Volova, who was on the first panel and somewhere here, I think, uh, Loretta Musgul, and also our facilities department for making all this possible. Thank you, and look forward to being in touch. <laughs>